My today's talk is only go, is going to focus around a very, very simple idea. And it's not new, because that's, you know, I looked up Ted and they said, so is your idea new and it's not new? It's simply about air and water. Uh, the two things that uh, are, you know, are the things that make up for life and are the two things that you can't replace on the planet. Uh, it's not coincidental that uh, as an architect, I mean, I've been working in uh, Delhi and in India for uh, now, what, 17 years, but uh, you know, some point 100 years from now, I think they're going to look back and say, why didn't we just crucify all the architects in India? for what they've done. And where we are today is, this came out last week, uh, Delhi is uh, the world's most polluted city. Let's forget the fact whether the data is accurate or not, but we know we are living in one of the most polluted countries in the world, and second is water. This came out today morning, Gurgaon is dying. But we know that as well, that uh, uh, most of our cities, most of, uh, in many parts of India, we have an acute water shortage, and that's gonna be our biggest challenge in times to come. So, uh, you know, years back I started thinking about the fact that uh, why, and you know, I engaged with policy makers and I only got one answer, population bothe. You know, we're 1.2 billion people. You know, it's, it's, a, it's you know, there's a, there's a lot of issue. So, I'll do it. So I said, fine, sorry. Is population really the issue? So we said, fine, if I look at the 1.2 billion people and, uh, you know, we have roughly about, uh, uh, you know, simple math uh, says that, uh, you know, that come, translates to about uh, five people per uh, family and, uh, you know, that'll come to a certain number of families. And if I took each family and I made them stay in a place like, say, Jorbar, gave them each one a 200 square meter, 200 square meter plot of land, and with all the infrastructure and greens and hospitals and schools and everything, I would need 8% of India's land mass. That's all that I would need to be able to house the entire 1.2 billion people in that kind of an environment. If I was to take the entire world, it'd be about, uh, you know, about 40% of India's land mass. So, you know, clearly it's, you know, population can't be the issue. So is energy the issue? I said, well, let's take all of India's energy demand and by doing a simple math, depending on the, how much solar radiation we receive, I said, if we drove that entire energy from clean energy, moved away from, uh, coal and thermal and all the other ones, then how much land would I need? I need 2.2% of India's wasteland, 0.1% of India's total land area to power the entire country with energy. <coughs> and that would be completely clean, that would take care of the air pollution. And uh, so obviously, you know, energy is not the issue. Then what about water? If you look at our entire rainfall that falls in India, and uh, we said we harvested a third of it. Normally, you would take about 50%. If you took a third of it, I get about 2,000 liters of water per person. The global standard is 150 liters. So clearly, water is not the issue. Then what is really the issue? Why are we living in, uh, in India, where uh, we're living in amongst the worst air uh, quality on the planet, and <coughs> uh, where water is extremely scarce? So the answer comes in the fact as to how we build. And how we build is that most uh, buildings in India generate uh, you know, nearly half the carbon dioxide that goes into the atmosphere. It consumes about half the resource in terms of energy, mineral, water, minerals, uh, and a tremendous amount of water consumption and waste. To do what? To provide shelter. To provide shelter from what? The sun, rain. What else do buildings really do? It's essentially a third skin. And we've done this brilliantly for a very, very long time. We've done this for thousands of years. These are all pictures of you know, historical buildings, uh, vernacular architecture. Uh, and we built, at that time, not trying to save the planet. No one really gave a damn about saving the planet till Al Gore came up with his uh, uh, theory of uh, climate change, which is actually very accurate. But they were simply building in a way because they didn't have access to water and power distribution. So they said, fine, we'll build it passively and we'll, we'll, we'll work out ways of adapting to climate and we'll do it without consuming energy. <clears throat> so that's, you know, sort of a thought process saying, how do we, in the new world, start building and redefine the way that we used to build, but in a contemporary format? So, four issues. One is build efficiently. Now, the average weight of a building, like this one, is roughly about one and a half to two tons per square meter. So typically speaking, an office building 
would require 15,000 kgs of material to provide shelter to one person who on an average weighs 60 kgs. And you know, that's the inefficiency of how we build. In residential buildings and houses, in the houses that you live in, it's even worse. It's about 50,000 kgs of material that comes from various parts. You know, Some might be regional, some might be global. But all that material comes together to provide shelter to one person. Second is the notion of thermal comfort, air conditioning. And I was sitting there freezing right now. I have my jacket on. It's winter. It's beautiful outside. The reason I kept stepping out was to sit, go in the sun. We've got lights on, and that AC is blowing directly. On my and we are trained now to, to understand that our body, and this is what engineering has done in a way, is that it's told us that our comfort sits between 22 and 24 degrees, and 55% to 60% relative hum humidity. And the, you know, you teach kids from about that high in schools now, all the way till you get old. And eventually, what happens? You get, it's cocaine, it's addiction. Comfort is addiction, right? And I can assure you that my body is far more resilient than two degrees, you know? And we mapped out various, all the five climatic zones of India, and we came to a conclusion and said that, wait a minute, 80% of the time, we don't need the bloody air conditioning. If you build well, not as a new idea, we just look back and see how we built before, you can do that, you know? We can knock off 80% of energy consumption in buildings simply by building correctly. Light, for Christ's sake, it's free. One thing we don't have a paucity of in India is light. In fact, we have too much of it. Switching on a light, artificial light in the day, should be equivalent to uh, a crime. It should be a criminal offense. This, it's abundant. Why? Why is it that, to date, all our buildings now are designed to have lights on in the day? water and waste. But I've said earlier that we have enough. We have enough in Delhi. We have enough everywhere. How do we begin to harvest it? So we, I'm going to show you three simple examples of what we did with that. And uh, you know, one thing I learned very quickly while working with urban policy makers is that nothing succeeds like success. So you have to create the prototypes. And that's what they always said, ah, sab hai. we know all this, but it doesn't really work. You know, how are you going to do it? So we uh, we did a, we took on certain projects to demonstrate that it can be done. So this is a college of uh, design, Pearl Academy of Fashion in Jaipur, Rajasthan, very hot climate. And uh, we went about saying that how do we make this building uh, completely comfortable and how do we break the barriers of saying that we can do this with zero energy, zero water, zero waste. That's our starting point. So well, let's begin only by taking local materials from around the site. <coughs> we designed a form, which was very, very simple, a rectangle, because you know it's a hot climate, so you decrease the surface area, you get lesser radiation. We carved out courtyards in the building, which is nothing new, but they were all carved based on solar movement, so you don't get any sun in the building uh, from, for 10 months of the year, only in the two months that you really need it. And then we found that, you know, we were looking at uh, traditional architecture, so, you know, baulis, uh, you know, and how do they work, and why did they make baulis in the first place? Smart, smart cookies back then, because three meters below the surface of the earth, the temperature of the, of the earth is exactly equal to the average temperature of the region, anywhere on the planet. In the case of Jaipur, 25 degrees. Okay, so that's why the baulis worked well. So we built a bauli. Right? And we said, we'll take the building, build efficiently. Instead of doing three levels, we'll do two levels. We'll create the bauli. The bauli itself will be a level in its, uh, in its play. We'll so you get evaporation through the middle of the building. It cools the building down. We'll put external jalis on the outside. Again, an old idea. Keep the sun out, let filtered light in. We'll insulate the building with a very, very old technique of using matkas, okay? Because air is the best insulator. So you invert the matkas, you put it on the roof, gives you great insulation. And that was a completed building. 46 degrees outside, we got 29 degrees inside without air conditioning. <laughs> the building, building has been operational for four years now. It has done very well. It's won many awards. It's, and that we, we pushed ourselves because, you know, we've been trying to push this discourse for a very, very long time. 
we as Indians or from this region, we know how to build. It's in our DNA, right? But we somehow somewhere along the line, post-1991, just forgot all about it. So the building's fine. It works well. It's 100% daylight. That's the bowli at the bottom. The courtyards. The external jali built on site. And then it's a graphical chart. But essentially, when people tell you, and you may have heard of green rating systems, that <coughs> my building is lead platinum and Griha five star. But you know, on an energy index, those buildings are at 140. The Pearl Academy of Fashion operates at 25. Okay? And it does this without consuming uh, any uh, energy. So we said, wait a minute. Okay. So we went back to the urban policy makers. We showed them this. They said, great, but then it'll work for a small building. So fine, but let's increase the scale. So last year we started out on this one. Uh, it's a, this is a emphasis new campus in Nagpur, heart of India. You know, all the perils of all the heat and the cold and all of that. Much larger building, 140 acres, huge campus. And uh, so we went to uh, Mr. Murthy and we told him that uh, we want to build, and our only vision for this project is to build the world's most sustainable building at that scale. Because we want to show that we can do it. We've done it on a small building. We want to show that we can do it on a much larger one. <coughs> so we did a lot of climate study. I'll skip that. We studied the earth and we said, what is the most optimum height of building that we can work with based on the bearing capacity of the land? 10, uh, you know, 10 to 12 stories high. Bearing capacity of, of the earth is critically important for design simply because you, know, you go into a high earthquake zone and you build a tall building and it suddenly requires a lot more resource. This was seismic zone two, so heights were possible. We looked at the land, we did our calculation and we came up with an idea of carrying capacity. Now, what is carrying capacity? You know, how many people should Delhi have? 15 million, 20 million, 30 million? But what is the carrying capacity of Delhi? You know, how much can water sustain? So we looked at it, we did a calculation. If we harvested the water that was falling only on our land, we could support 20,000 people without taking a single drop of water from the state. We did the same thing for energy. We said, if we took the 20,000 people, how much uh, renewable energy can we generate on site so we don't take a single bit of energy from the grid as well? And then we put that all together. We mapped the air flows, which are coming into it, so because we wanted, we wanted to accelerate wind movement using the Venturi effect during the uh, monsoon months when the humidity is high, because you want to offset it. Five minutes left. And we came up with a master plan, which essentially laid out all the targets that would make this the most sustainable building in the world. We then looked at a very, very old uh, uh, notion of orientation where the sun is. And you would by and large be told that, you know, face north or face south. Not true, as we discovered. Nagpur is on the tropics, it is exactly 22 and a half degrees. So by tilting the building by 22 and a half degrees, you actually naturally cut down solar radiation. The advantage that we have today over our ancestors is the fact that we have computational tools by which we can now put metrics to what they were doing heuristically. So we designed the flow plates, 100% daylighting, and came up with a geometry of how these buildings could interlock, each one of these creating exactly the same parameters of 100% daylighting, uh, zero energy, zero water, zero waste. That's the project. We started construction. This is a Nagpur. It's Infosys campus. 20,000 people, sorry, and it's going to be a completely net zero carbon neutral campus. It can't be done at that scale. <laughs> Well, we went back to the urban policy makers. He said, yes, great idea. We can do this for campuses and buildings, but cities are far more complex. They're right, they are far more complex. So we looked at Delhi. And when we looked at Delhi, uh, it was impossible to get a satellite image till about six, seven years back because it was considered a security risk. Then Google came along and it was suddenly all free. 
you know, so a, and suddenly you saw Delhi from above, you know, and you saw, you saw what was happening, etc., whatever. And we began to find a very, very interesting thing in Delhi, and not only in Delhi, in all Indian cities, because our cities are not new. Our cities are organically evolved over a long period of time. Other than, say, Chandigarh, which is a new city, pretty much every other city in this country has evolved over hundreds of years. But today, we know all of this, you know. Uh, we've got 8 million vehicles on the road in Delhi, much uh, more than all the other, other metros put together. Average speed of a vehicle in Delhi is 25, cycling is 16, very soon we'll be at par. <laughs> Pedestrian accessibility, we lose a thousand people a year on Delhi's roads, okay? And that's more than what SARS did, but no one talks about Delhi's uh, pedestrian issues. <laughs> Pollution, we know. Delhi's lost 30 meters of water table in the last 50 years alone, and it's parching. And sewage. 60% of Delhi sewage flows openly in nalas, okay, which has public health issues, dengue, this, that, and the other. But more importantly, of the remaining 40% that does find its way into sewage treatment plant, God bless Google for this, is that, you know, if you see that that's a typical sewage treatment plant in Delhi, Delhi has several of these. Out of the 16 aerators, one is working. So the sewage that goes in and what comes out, and the certificate says it's perfectly clean which is what goes into the Yamuna, which is why the Yamuna is a Nala as well. That's not true because they're not working. None of them are working. So we said, what can we do with this? Okay, and we sat down and over a year, we mapped each and every Nala of Delhi. There were 20,000 Nalas. Total Nala length of 350 kilometers. Most importantly, they're still contiguous. So you can walk from Kutub Minar to Patel Chest without crossing a road. And that, that network, exist today. But that network carries sewage in it, right? Originally, a lot of these nalas were built by the Tuklaks 700 years back to bring fresh water from the river to the city. And today, they carry sewage. So we said, well, this is a picture of a nala. We said, why not, why not try and clean up these nalas by treating the sewage where it enters the nala by using simple organic treatment? So they're plants, which are called reeds, and by planting them, it'll break down the sewage into clean water. Because that's what uh, the roots of the plants do. They, gen you know, they grow bacteria, bacteria is a crap, you get clean water. Modulate the embankments, and you get cycling and walking tracks throughout Delhi. <coughs> so, uh, we put up this exercise. In fact, all our monuments sit on this. They all sit on nalas. And by converting them to freshwater canals, and treating them and connecting them to back alleyways, what you will get is the water table will rise because you've got fresh water. You'll solve the sewage problem of Delhi. You will get safe mod more modes of transport, of walking and cycling throughout the entire city, last mile connectivity with the metro, and you suddenly turn the city inside out. Because Delhi essentially is a, is a city of boundary walls. There are, no democratic, there are no democratic or public spaces left. Everyone puts a boundary wall around their uh, piece of land, whether it's a park or whether it's a building or whether it's a house. But this will open the city inside out and make the roads the backyard of Delhi. It's been done in China, but on a smaller scale. It's been done in Pune at the Osho Ashram, using plants to clean sewage. In fact, in uh, Seoul, they pulled down a six-lane flyover and restored the Nala as a freshwater canal through the city. The temperature dropped by three degrees in the area and the average traffic speed went up. So this notion of building flyovers has been proven time and again that it doesn't really solve the traffic problem. It just redistributes it. We did the math on this. Delhi has already spent close to 10,000 crores in trying to clean the Yamuna, and it's still a drain. Our proposal was 750 crores, which is why probably it wasn't a very popular one with the, with the policy makers. We should have added another zero behind it. <laughs> it might have been more viable. We then went about saying, it's a simple idea. I'll solve 10 problems simultaneously. Who do we go to? This is Delhi's governance chart. It took one year to me, for me to find out who is responsible for what. And this is the tip of the iceberg. It's a three-dimensional chart. It's a piece of work. You know, Central government, state government, water separate, sewage separate, traffic separate. It's incredible. Each one. Each policymaker in each of these 32 departments said, great idea, okay? What I could not do was get all 32 of them together in one room. So that's what you need to get a decision. And it is impossible because the governance structure does not allow you to do that. So we went to the press. The press lapped it up. 
it was it was you know on on World Earth Day in Rio. It was the opening program. The Nalas got a lot of international support. In fact, it was shocking because they called me the face of Nalas, <laughs> which was horrific to hear. But uh, we set up a website, DelhiNalas.org. We got about 50,000 people to sign up on that. We had many agencies, uh, including a promise from UNESCO saying, restore the Nalas, we'll give it world heritage status, because it's a 700-year-old network. We got, finally, after a lot of uh, advocacy and lobbying, we got the LG to change the master plan of Delhi, saying that the Nala network should be restored and turned into freshwater streams. This was last year. Now, the government is finally going ahead and executing that program. Though, you know, execution and the government are one, uh, you know, are two different things. <laughs> so, you know, that's my last slide. And, uh, you know, why I really like this slide is the termites for thousands of years, tens of thousands of years, have got the act of building right. Okay, so that's a termite hill. You know, 50 degree variation outside. The queen's chamber is exactly at 29 degrees. No architects, no engineers, no policy makers, nothing. Termites by and large are blind. What went wrong with us? You know, and a sense, in a sense, I think my idea is that, you know, we, we may be living in a world diarrheated with data information and knowledge, but wisdom, that's the idea, the preservation of wisdom. Thank you.